So after two videos about the framework desktop, which have by far the worst like to dislike ratio on my channel, uh, one of them is even private because my baby mind couldn't take the criticism anymore, I wanted to make this video where I go back in for the third time to make another stinker about the framework desktop. This time I actually put my money where my mouth is and build a tiny desktop, which has some framework-like features that the actual framework desktop does not offer. And along this journey, there were actually some surprising moments that made me realize why the framework desktop is designed the way it is, at least in some ways. So if this sounds interesting to you, sit back, relax, grab a cup of hot chalky, and let me take you on a journey where I build, show off, benchmark, and ultimately conclude if this is the way to go for portable desktops. But before we get into it, if you like my videos and you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate if you could subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. So let's start by actually building the computer. The base, uh, the case itself, is none other than the Inwin Shopin Max. This is, at least in my opinion, the best choice for a computer like this. For around $115, you get an extremely well-built 3.3-liter uh, mini ITX case with a PSU included. The Max in the name actually means it comes with an upgraded power supply. The old one was actually 150 watts bronze and this one is 200 watts gold, so a nice improvement. And next to two USB-A Gen 3 ports, you also get one USB-C 3.2 Gen 2x2, meaning it supports up to 20 gigabits per second. That's crazy. But if you're broke like me, unfortunately the actual uh, transfer speed will be limited by the USB-C header on the motherboard. In this case, it's limited to 5 gigabits. Also not bad, but it's not 20. But now we come to the most important part of this build, the CPU. Well, technically an APU, meaning it's a CPU and GPU in one. It is the AMD 8600G with the Radeon 760M as the GPU. This is clearly a downgrade compared to the uh, AMD AI Max APUs that come in the framework desktop, but it's also much, much cheaper. I paid around $210. It's a six core, 12 thread CPU built on Zen 4 with a TDP of 65 watts. And it actually comes with a surprisingly compact cooler in the box. Conveniently, it has exactly the same height as the maximum supported by our Inwin Shopin. Now, I actually wasn't sure if this meant that it's going to fit, but it did, thankfully. Uh, and that saves us a lot of money because these low profile coolers normally cost, I don't know, like 50 bucks. So this saved us like 50 bucks. Thank you, AMD. Very cool. Then we have the motherboard. I chose the Gigabyte A620iAX because it was the cheapest AM5 Mini ITX motherboard I could find. Still, motherboards are pretty expensive nowadays, so this one cost me around $150. But for being a lower-end chipset, it actually comes with really cool features, like a 2.5 gigabit LAN port, or a 5 gigabit USB-C port, or Wi-Fi 6E. And now some of you know what's coming. If you don't, I advise turning this video off because I don't want you to get depressed. Yes, everything you buy is getting more expensive because apparently more monkey pooping Sora videos need to be produced because there is still some brain out there in the world that needs to be rotted. Thankfully, I actually managed to get a pretty good deal on a used DDR5 kit. 16 gigs of RAM, uh, A data, 4800 megahertz, two 8 gigabyte sticks. Now, if an alarm just went off in your head when you heard 4800 megahertz, don't worry, we will talk about it later in the video. I paid 73 bucks for this kit, which normally would not be a good price, but in a world where the uh, prices of DDR5 RAM went up by more than 300% in the past few months, uh, you cannot complain. 
Oh, and the last component, which I thankfully did not have to buy for this computer because I recycled it for my old desktop, is the SSD. Because what the hell? I bought this ADATA M.2 SSD back in February 2025 for around $65, and now it's $120. But enough complaining, let's get back into the video. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? The build itself was super easy. You pop in the RAM, put the CPU in the socket, install the CPU cooler and the M.2 SSD, and then drop the whole motherboard into the case. The only thing left is to connect everything and cable manage, which is unsurprisingly pretty hard in such a cramped case. But after about 40 minutes, everything was done and ready to be booted up. For this video, I installed and tested everything on Windows, but I have a video planned where I'll be comparing Bazai to Windows. So if you would like to see that, let me know in the comments. Now, if you remember, at the beginning, I said that my desktop actually offers some very framework-like features that the framework desktop does not. What are these? Well, there are three that I want to talk about. And let's start with the simplest one, and that is, a CPU socket. Pfft, I know, crazy. You can buy this thing called a processing module, aka an AM5 CPU, and you can just put it into the motherboard instead of this one I have here, and it will just work. Everything from the 6 core 8400F to the 16 core 9950X3D will technically work. Now, of course, I wouldn't recommend pairing the highest-end AM5 CPU with the lowest-end AM5 chipset, but you get the point. This means I didn't have to worry about buying a 2-year-old CPU, even though there is a 9000G series uh, coming soon, probably, because if I would like the performance of that, I could just buy the CPU and switch them out. You know, sounds very eco-friendly and upgradable. Where did I hear that before? Next up, the full PCI-X16 slot. This allows us to install a graphics module, aka a dedicated GPU. The framework desktop only offers a PCIe-X4 port, which is also close-ended, meaning you cannot physically install a larger card. Now sure, even though the port is 16 lanes long, it actually only is connected to 8 lanes, but still, it is enough bandwidth to support basically anything you would reasonably want to put into there. And honestly, I don't understand why Framework didn't give us a more capable PCIe slot. There was actually some debate I read where someone said that the new AI CPUs only support 16 PCIe 4 lanes instead of 20, which was uh, on the older generation. But now with the new AI CPUs also on the Framework 16, it's also only 16 lanes supported. And the Framework Laptop 16 manages to allocate eight of them to this interposer, which then can be connected to a GPU or the two M.2 ports. So what's the reason, Framework? And I also get that a dedicated GPU will not fit into the Framework uh, desktop case. It will also not fit into this case, but you can buy the mainboard separately and put it into any uh, case you want. So if you know the real reason for this decision, let me know in the comments. I would really like to find out. And now the last revolutionary feature, the memory module, aka DDR5 RAM. This is arguably the most talked about issue when it comes to the framework desktop, and it actually sets the stage for the main topic for the rest of the video, and that is memory bandwidth. These two slots allow us to install almost any DDR5 configuration we want. It's easy to pop them out and replace them. Sounds very framework-like, no? Well, there's a problem. In systems like this, or the framework desktop, where the CPU and GPU live on the same chip, the system memory becomes extremely important. Unlike a dedicated GPU, an APU has no VRAM. It uses the system memory for this. And this system memory has much lower bandwidth. The math is actually super simple in our scenario. The frequency of our memory is 4800 megahertz, meaning 48 
hundred mega transfers per second multiplied by the width of the bus, which is in our case 64 bits. And because we have two sticks, we multiply this by two. This is about 614 gigabits a second, which needs to be divided by eight to actually get the gigabytes per second number. And that is 76.8. Sounds like a lot, right? Well, let's put that into perspective. The RDX 1590, which is like the best consumer GPU you can buy as of recording this video, has a much wider memory bus at 512 bits. It also uses the GDDR7 memory, which runs at 28,000 mega transfers per, per second. If we put this into our formula, we actually get a bandwidth of 1.8 terabytes per second, which is roughly 23 times more than what we have right here. In fact, to find a GPU with such low memory bandwidth, we have to go all the way to 2009 to the GeForce GTS 240. This is how it looks. This has the same memory bandwidth. So what did Framework do about this? Well, they used LP DDR5 X memory, running at 8,000 megatransfers per second and having a 256 bit bus. This means that they achieved a memory bandwidth of 256 gigabytes per second, which is three times more than what we achieved. But the downside is obvious. The memory is soldered. You cannot upgrade it. You cannot easily repair it. There actually is a theoretical solution to this problem and it's called LPCAM2. This is RAM that uses LPDDR5X, but can be replaced, can be upgraded. It looks like this. It's a little different to these two, but you get the point. And Framework with AMD actually really tried to get this working, but they wrote on their blog that it's quote, not possible without massively downclocking the memory, which would basically defeat the purpose of using this RAM. Now, coming back to our system, there is another huge advantage to using DDR5, scale. There are tens of millions of people using this RAM and at any given point, there's probably a lot of them upgrading or selling their RAM for any reason, meaning you can get good prices on them even in such bad times as these. Sure, it will be more than what we were used to, but it's better than being dependent on the manufacturer which actually solders your RAM. We actually live in a world where, at least in my market, it's almost impossible to find a new 16 gig kit. This means two 8 gigabyte sticks really almost impossible. So the fact that there are really millions of people in Europe that have this kit in their computer, there's a high chance that at least some of them will want to get rid of them. And because these are used, but have been in a computer, so they're probably mint, you know, there's not that much you can do to a RAM when it's in a computer, you can buy this much, much cheaper. And you know, even if there's a shortage, you really benefit from a lot of people already owning this product. And now let's finally look at how this thing performs and how it compares to the framework desktop. In Cinebench R23, I got a multi-core score of 12,917, which is less than half of what the AI Max 385 gets at 28,887. Yes, it has higher TDP, but uh, I chose this fight. Single core came at 1772, again lower than the AI Max's 2150. Then we move to Firestrike, where the memory bandwidth really starts to show. I scored 5192, while the average for the same CPU GPU combo is 7084. This is mostly due to slow RAM, but also the fact that the A620 chipset doesn't allow you to overclock. The framework desktop absolutely destroys this result with a score of 24,274. And looking at the breakdown, the biggest difference comes from the GPU results. The physics, the actual CPU test is almost identical. 
So yes, modern AMD iGPUs are really, really good. But what do they need to be this really good? Yes, memory bandwidth. But nobody actually cares about benchmark score. How does it game? Well, I built this computer mainly to play online games with my friends, so the two I tested were CS2 and PUBG. In CS2, at 1080p, I got around 90 to 100 FPS. But let's be honest, you shouldn't play CS2 at 16x9 anyway, so let's switch to 4x3, 1280x1024. At this resolution, I got around 110 to 130 FPS, meaning you can almost fully take advantage of a 144 Hz monitor. For PUBG, I set it to 1080p very low and got around 40 to 60 FPS, depending on where I was at the moment. But because PUBG isn't a very smooth game, at least compared to CS2, this lower frame rate didn't actually feel as bad. And if you're wondering how loud does the system get under load, well, have a listen. Not bad at all. Oh, and one last thing, I actually ran these tests before and after installing the newest BIOS and the results were surprisingly different. So if you would like to read about it, I would really recommend checking out my GitHub repository in the description. I have all of the benchmarks, all of these numbers there. So if you would like to read more about this, uh, just check it out. So what's the conclusion? Well, I built a much more modular computer, which is in some use cases up to five times slower than the framework desktop, but is third of the price. Simple, no? But to be a little bit more serious, the whole build cost me around $613 after tax, which nowadays would be almost impossible if you would like to only buy new parts. So I would really recommend buying used storage and used RAM. Then I think you can hit this price. On the other hand, the framework desktop, which granted has double the RAM, which nowadays is a huge thing, would cost around $1,735 with tax. For me, this is European prices after tax. And this is almost three times as much. So I guess it's up to you. Do you need the performance or are you okay with what the desktop APUs and DDR5 RAM can do? For me, the most important question was, which computer would make me feel like I actually own the hardware? Like I actually have power over what I own? This has been the question, the, the reason why I actually decided to support Framework in the first place, starting with the Framework 13. And to be honest, this thing with all of its quirks and memory bandwidth issues just feels much more closer to the answer than the framework desktop. But you could still send me one for a review framework, no?